you weren't even included in the equation. <laughs> right. Well, that's just not fair. We can't make enough money selling shoes on eBay from Ferguson, motherfucker. <laughs> but I'll digress because yes. because there's still more of the story, and I'm sure there's all kinds of other things here. I'm going to pick apart into a million little pieces. <laughs> but anyway, yes, they, they must look beyond, you know, top schools such as MIT and Stanford and go out and hire the worst. <laughs> yeah. That's right, businessmen and entrepreneurs of the United States. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's it's now incumbent upon you in the new age of equality to go out and hire the worst scum of the earth. To, <laughs> yes, to start your business and run it right into the ground. <laughs> yes, because that's what you'll get. Because oh, Reggie can't come in today. Oh, why is he sick? No, man, he's high on crack. What? <laughs> Well, what about uh, Giorgio Hernandez? Yes. <laughs> and Giorgio can't come in, man. He's doing a ride to Compton. <laughs> Next window. <laughs> <laughs> well, McAllister says that much of the $250,000 grant, which will go to Chinley Monument Valley and a third high school yet to be named will be spent on providing teachers with training to teach students coding. In addition, Intel will provide on-site assistance in the mentoring of some of its Native American staffers, a few of whom graduated from the high schools receiving the grant. It's critical to bring a science and coding curriculum to life and off-project-based learning, as opposed to just rote learning, says McAllister. Well, I would say to McAllister, let's fix uh, that basic rote learning education in this country first before kind of specializing, huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't freaking know. I don't know. I don't know. But hey, uh, now our next story is going to take us into uh, something that the minorities are equally as skilled in, which is astronomy. <laughs> right you heard me right and astronomers white ones <laughs> yes they found something they found a young new jupiter-like planet that's right uh, astro astronomers have spotted a jupiter-like planet that could hold the answer to how our solar system was formed what you idiots don't know that yet <laughs> well the planet 51 iridani b is roughly twice the size of jupiter which is freaking huge. <laughs> and young, by planetary standards, at 20 million years old, at 800 degrees Fahrenheit the surface, the planet's surface is still glowing with heat from its creation and offers clues about how it was formed, according to a stu study published in the Journal of Science yesterday. Located, located, I should say, about 96 light years from Earth, 51 Iridani B is the first planet discovered with a new direct imaging instrument coined the Gemini Planet Imager, or you'll like this, minorities, the GPI. <laughs> yo, 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 I be studying hard to get working on the GPI. <laughs> mm -hmm. The direct imaging instrument is mounted to the 27-foot-long Gemini South Telescope in Chile. The instrument uses different processes than NASA's Kepler Space Telescope to find planets. While Kepler lo looks for shadows and obstructions of starlight that could signify a planet, the GPI was designed to discover a faint young planets orbiting bright stars. The planet's methane-rich atmosphere, which makes it smell like Gilbert, Gilbert's apartment, <laughs> makes uh, 51 Iridani B more Jupiter-like than any other expectant scientists have discovered as of yet. Co-author Travis Barman, a researcher at the University of Arizona, said in a statement today, he said the new instrument could play a vital role in identifying and understanding how solar systems similar to ours form. The 51 Iridan B is the first young planet that probably looks like Jupiter did billions of years ago, making it currently our most important corner piece of the planet formation jigsaw puzzle, Barman said. It's uh, pretty amazing. They've got a lot of uh, photos here, of course, and uh, we were going to actually have the, 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 the top best top 20 photos of the day when we started the show. <laughs> 
but you know, that's kind of hard to do on the radio. Yes. <laughs> And I know I, I did tell the listeners in the uh, the description for this show yes that we would uh, you know it, it, we realize they can't actually see the pictures that we're talking <laughs> about right? but I, I I told them that you know uh, you and Louie and I would uh, would would look them over and, and discuss them yes uh, but Kissy apparently doesn't like that idea <laughs> so Seinfeld hey can I see you dick? there you go. <laughs> There you go. And there they go. And now the the, the 51 Iridani B planet is actually twice the size of Jupiter. And Jupiter itself is freaking massive compared to the Earth. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know what all this has to do with anything relevant. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I mean, it's great. I mean, they, they show a comparative model course of... Uh, 51 Iridani B yes. uh, next to Jupiter and, and yes. then, of course, next to the wee, wee, tiny little Earth. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, oh, Jay Leno, we got a request. Oh, I uh, read somewhere that you and Fadek, uh, yeah, can you show it to me? <laughs> Only if it's as big as Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. Always when, always with a female and having a relationship, married or thing, yeah. it's always better that they do the leaving. If you do leaving, if you take that lingering thing, you know what I mean? Well, you know, if anybody knows about lingering, it's the planets. <laughs> well, thank you for tuning in to today's edition of All About the Planets. <laughs> yeah, so so then they get the picture, the, the comparative size yes. of, of 51 Iridani B uh, next to Jupiter and then next to the wee wee tiny little Earth. And yes. And then I'm looking at it, and I'm like, okay, so what's your point? If we're the wee-wee tiny little Earth, if this thing is uh, 90 billion light years away, if we can't possibly get a ship to it within the next 200 years, uh, all of this is, is kind of moot, no? Yes. You know? No, it's, it's great that the planet's out there. Don't get me wrong. Yes. Yeah, it's out there, and it's it's doing its cooling down thing. And, yes. You know, <laughs> Right, and in another, oh, I don't know, what, 80 billion years, it'll look a lot like our Jupiter. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So what? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the so what. Yes. Here, here's the point of it all. Now, here's a segue. No, what? Yeah? Gilbert, are you still there? <laughs> all right, what, what's, your, what's your segue? So, I could... I could see you feel very uncomfortable talking. No, don't, don't, don't even, yeah. don't even go there. Don't even go there. We're not talking about that again. Same ever. thing. It's got nothing to do with Jupiter. <laughs> no. <clears throat> and now, thank you very much. I've completely forgotten where I was going with that entire thing. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. It really is. I, I'm I'm completely interested. But you know, why don't th why doesn't I should say why doesn't yes. this show tell you about things that might possibly in an infinitesimal kind of I don't know really long equation done by some of the most brilliant minds on the planet who are not minorities. <laughs> Why, why wouldn't I tell you about something that, that, that might somehow, in some small, tiny way, ever get to mattering to any one of you out there? <laughs> you know. Well, seriously. No, no, seriously. Seriously. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. How does knowing about Iridani 51B light ripple yes. uh, planet... <laughs> Uh, 90 billion light years away. You know, last time I looked, not even the minorities had rides that could go that fast. Okay. So they can't do it. Yes. Uh, we can't do it. Richard Branson certainly can't do it. Uh, we're not going to be there for at least another 250, 300, even 700 years. <laughs> Does this story matter to anybody? Anybody on this planet right now? No. No, it doesn't. Now, here's a story I'm sure you're tired of talking about, but 
I'd be remiss in not bringing it up, and that's when you beat up a transvestite. You, you know, it's funny you bring that up. <laughs> because, here's the here's the thing. Yes. Uh, my beating up a transvestite or a transsexual... Yes. <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, is infinitely more relevant to our listeners than anything to do with this story. (laughs) We're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. And you didn't. (laughs) So... I'm not. That's not going to be our last story. Yes. I'm not leaving, uh, kicking off the weekend on such a low freaking note. Yes. No. <laughs> no. So I'm going to bring in, uh, well, what I like to call my little crash bonus story. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You get the Crash Jesus bonus story today just for stopping in. The music is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got to hear it. Oh, um, I'm... I was playing it in my mind. Actually, I was going to have something queued up, but it, it just dawned on me at the end of the show here. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move on to something that might actually have something to do with somebody today, uh, or indeed in the near future, you know, i.e. less than 90 billion light years from now. <laughs> How about, uh, well, Secretary of State John Kerry. Yeah. As he calls for democracy in Cuba, as U.S. flag is raised today, yes, today was the day. We've been telling you about it a couple of times uh, this week. Yes. In Havana today, the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry called for an end to the mutual isolation and issued an impassioned plea for democracy in Cuba. What an idiot. (laughs) Doesn't he know they're communists? Yeah, that's that's the whole problem. What was it? Sixty years ago, they 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 went and did what they did because they don't want to be democratic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or did you just miss that on the newsreel? <laughs> and I goddamn know John Kerry is old enough to remember it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Cuba. That's the key. That's your answer. Just become democratic. Let's open a McDonald's. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> and, and you'll be fine, because yes. because look what we did to Russia. <laughs> look at, look at that. Yeah, we took a, the, the, the communist motherland. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and overnight, the sleeping actor Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yes. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. <laughs> But you fucking crazy? We'll lose everything. <laughs> Just tear it down. It looks good on the news. <laughs> Remember me in 2016. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not dead. I'm still here. <laughs> Nancy, where's my shoes? <laughs> yes. Now, uh, see, here, here's the thing now. Yeah, tear down that wall. And, uh, oh, okay. Russia, a huge civil war, uh, split up into 240 tiny countries, most of which who are still fighting and killing each other today. <laughs> but we've got that McDonald's in Moscow. <laughs> oh, and this just in, Sharon Chesley uh, stating openly in the uh, HTLA live chat room that she loves sucking the cigar. <laughs> Oh, and, and she can suck your cigar while having a beer. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, Sharon, actually put that on, on, on video, just on your cell phone or whatever, and throw that up on the HTLA page for us. Yeah. <clears throat> she, she, oh, wait a minute. She says, I do mean cigar. Uh, wait, a, wait a second here. I got to scroll. Don't, don't be thinking other things. Ah, shit. God damn it! Let's see. She knows that's all we think about. Yes. Come on! <laughs> God damn it! You know, all week she's been. You know, I, I and I've said it on the show. Yes. Sharon's on her porch, topless and masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, so she knows. Yes. See, that's a, she. She knows. Oh, I love a cigar when I'm drinking beer. Yes. <laughs> she knows what the old crash man does with that information. <laughs> Yeah, so that little disclaimer there, don't be thinking other things, that's 
Yeah, that's just for, for yours truly. Fine. Well, screw you. I'm going to think about it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Only the tip of the iceberg. And that's about all my brain does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just do the tip and Ronald Reagan impressions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nancy and I were going down to the ranch for the weekend. Yes. <laughs> I'm here in talks in Geneva with. Uh, <laughs> Hey, say what you will about Ronald Reagan, pal. Yes. Uh, you know what? I don't freaking care. He's a goddamn cowboy, and I love him. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you can't get dumber than uh, good old George W. <laughs> well, that's it. We're going to war in Iraq, and... Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, we are we are mission deplete. We, we are... <laughs> We will not rest until the ones who are responsible for something in New York <laughs> are, are, are put to sleep or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he, he goes and does that. Yes. And then he turns around in front of all of the media of the planet. Yes. <laughs> walks up to the double door, pulls the door you push, and walks into the wall. <laughs> So I'll stick to my Ronald Reagan, you sucks. <laughs> and Nancy and I still get it on, yeah. so I'll just think about that while I'm ass fucking her. <laughs> I'll be banging her no. cowboy style in Texas. Yes. <laughs> Yes, well, now it's time to reach out to one another as the two peoples. We no longer are enemies or rivals, but neighbors, says Carrie. <laughs> yes, who oversaw the event that followed a similar flag-raising ceremony last month outside the Cuban embassy in Washington. It's time to unfurl our flags, he said. <laughs> uh, I'm John Carrie. Mind if I... Unfurl my flag. <laughs> Little Cuban bitch be like, get out of here, cucho. <laughs> in, in fact, he's probably sitting at a bar in Cuba right now, trying that line on some chick. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kerry, who oversaw the event that followed a similar flag raising ceremony last month outside the Cuba's, Cuban embassy in Washington, said. It's time to unfurl our flags, raise them up, and let the world know that we wish each other well. Yeah. Yes. The flag raising represents the latest step in the changing relationship in Obama's mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is all the brainchild of President Obama, who has completely lost all sense of any reality he ever had since Oprah cried. <laughs> yes. Yes, that flag raising represents that latest step in the changing relationship between the two nations since President Obama went fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he and Cuban President Raul Castro announced an end to the diplomatic freeze back in December. Well, on Friday, Kerry uh, applauded the two leaders for their courageous decision and thanked Pope Francis, who doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything. <laughs> Well, no, Kerry goes on here to say that he helped facilitate the dialogue between uh, our president and, and Castro. I, I don't know how that would have worked, but... Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, to help raise the flag, American officials brought back three of the U.S. Marines who lowered it in 1961 when the U.S. cut off ties with Cuba at the peak of the Cold War. For our nations today, it represents the beginning of a new chapter and a key step in normalizing relations says Jeffrey D. Laurentis, the chief U.S. diplomat in Havana. He said in opening remarks, John Kerry called it a historic moment <laughs> and a day for pushing aside old barriers and exploring new possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> then Kerry ex uh, began to explain to the audience all about the planets. <laughs> Oh, you, you, oh, in the, in the chat room now, they're asking for a happier story. Yes. <laughs> oh, 
all right. Well, I, I think I can accommodate. Yes. Uh, I'll just, fine. I'll just close this story up. Don't care about freaking Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, there we go. So it's closed. And now it's all raw crash. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. So. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. I've only got six minutes left before it's a two-hour show. And, yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to fill that up with a little story, a little story that happened to me a number of years ago. Yes. And uh, it's a whole lot more entertaining than this John Kerry Cuba shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there I was. I, I just uh, got my, my 1979 uh, El Camino off the car lot. <laughs> <laughs> I did. 79 El Camino with the uh, small block 305. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, I, I did the camshaft and, yes. and uh, bored out the, the cylinders a little bit, add a little punch to the bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, I had the uh, the 68 Corvette rally wheels on it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, long story short, I decided to go out to the bar. Yes. So I, I drive out and I head down and I fucking go in the bar and I'm in the bar for, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour. I find the, the, the beautiful, tall, blonde girl, blonde, long, straight hair. <laughs> And, and she had the sweetest, sweetest. I, I mean, Phil's sister would be proud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we get to talking and stuff, and and you know, I like girls that don't piss around. Yes, <laughs> you know. Uh, there, there was none of this. Oh, come dance with me and buy me drinks all night. <laughs> no, no. No. <laughs> no, and then yeah, yes, Phil, big, big tits. Yeah. Oh. Well, okay. In fairness, they were like. You know, 38 C's or something. Yes. <laughs> not huge, but nice handfuls. And, you know, certainly not veiny with nasty areola. Yeah. <laughs> which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? Uh, I don't want to go there. I'm talking about 27 years ago. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, she wants to get out of the bar. Yes. She wants to get out of there. So we, we get out of there, and, and we get in my Camino, and she likes it. And she's like, ooh, leather interior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so where does she want to go? Well, she wants to go to Island View Beach. She actually said that. And, of course, well, if you're not from where I'm from, you wouldn't know what Island View Beach is. Yes. But uh, suffice it to say, it's, uh, you know, come and fuck me somewhere. Right. <laughs> So, and, and no, Sharon, I'm not going to move along. You asked for this. Yes. <laughs> so, so we're cruising out the highway, and we're, we're headed out to Allen View Beach where she wants to go. And, and we we did a lot of partying there all through my youth and whatnot. Yes. And we get out there, and, and uh, you know, uh, we have some beers and stuff. One thing leads to another. The next thing you know, I'm fucking her on the hood of the car. <laughs> all right? Well... I, I got her on her back on the hood, right in the center. Yes. And I'm banging away out of there. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it's pitch black out there. There's no lights. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just you know, beach and stars and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, that's how I got into a lot of girls' panties. I used to tell them all about the planets. <laughs> Anyway, long story short, uh, that's it. Uh, I, I dump my load. She <laughs> she dribbles it out all down in the front of the hood. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I end up taking her home. Yes. So that's fine. I take her home, get in the house, yeah, go to bed, yeah, shag a couple of more hours. Yes. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, by the morning, she was a pretty stinky oyster. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, here's the fun part of the whole story and how I'm going to kick you all off into the weekend. Yes. <laughs> I get up in the morning. Yes. I go down. I make my coffee. Yes. And uh, she comes down. She doesn't drink coffee. All of a sudden, I'm freaked out. <laughs> you know, this chick's gorgeous, but you don't drink coffee? Get out. You're not a human. <laughs> But whatever, she had a belly button ring, and I'm a sucker. So, yeah, yeah, yeah we dated for about eight months before she left me for another guy. Yes. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! But the the end of the story. Yes. <clears throat> she she gets dressed and stuff. She she gotta go to work or whatever. So she she, she just leaves, and I'm like, wow, I don't have to drive you. Yes. <laughs> 
Sweet, you go to work on your own, and that's that's a bonus. <laughs> So, so she goes to work and stuff, and I, I'm hanging around the house, and I'm doing whatever the hell I'm doing, and uh, got dressed and, and got got my stuff together. Went out to meet a friend for coffee or something in the afternoon. Yes. <laughs> and so so I just, I, I go down to the garage, and I get yes. I get in the car, and warming up, and I'm driving to the coffee shop, and the coffee shop is a big, busy one. It's a Cafe Fantastico on, on Cook Street in Victoria. Yes. And uh, Cook Street is down in the Cook Street Village, and, and if you've ever been there, it's a, it's a nice little place. It's kind of like, uh, well, nothing like Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so I get down there, and yes. I never get to find a parking spot right in front of this place. Never happens to me. Yes. That morning or, or that afternoon, oh, boom, what do you know? There's a parking spot right in front of the place. Yes. <laughs> So so great. So so I go and and I get out of the car and shut my door and I'm strutting up to the the coffee shop there and there's there's tons of people at this place. Yes. And they've got like tables outside out front on the sidewalk. It's about a 30 foot wide sidewalk kind of thing and they have yes. you know their tables and stuff. So there's like 30 40 50 people out there. Yes. And uh and I go meet my buddy Dave and Matt and we sit down and we go in and get our coffee and we'll come back out and sit down at a nice table and stuff and Yes. <laughs> And we're and we're looking at the car. Yes. And I, I didn't even notice it. Didn't even notice it. People started to crowd around the car. Yeah. <laughs> and then and I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> well, so whatever. Long and the short, we sit there for like another hour, hour and a half. People are still crowded around the car. And we're like, what the hell's wrong with the car? It's not smoking. Yes. It's not, you know, it's just sitting there it's looking nice. I'm thinking, it's just a '79 El Camino. It's it's nice, but. You know, it's it's no Ferrari or something. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, then of course we get up and we're all done our coffee and whatnot. Yes. So we we start to go our separate ways and and uh, Dave needs a ride. Yes. So I'm like, okay, Dave, well, hop in the passenger seat and we'll we'll take off. And yes. Okay. So so we start walking over to the car. We we go through the crowd of people. Yes. And 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 we look, and and then and then, and then it hits me. Yeah. <laughs> There's this perfect imprint of this girl's entire back of her body down to her butt crack, perfectly laden into the hood of my car, and the jizz is dry. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So there's some entertainment. Oh, yeah. I've got, I've got a ton more of those stories. Too. <laughs> we should just have sex talk with Crash Jesus. Uh, yes, it's been a fun ride, and I've loved it all, and poor Louie has suffered greatly because of it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, gang, we're out of here. We're, we're going to get the hell out of here. We're late tonight, and we're we're out of here, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. All right, get out of here. Yes. <laughs> well, I think the one, the only, Louie Lawless for being here today. Mr. T would be proud of you. Oh, did he bang girls on the hood, too? <laughs> just life and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Well, thank you. And we love having you every single day, Louie. That was a mistake on my part. All right. Well, we'll see you back here on Monday. <laughs> also, Gilbert, thank you for being here as always, my friend. Thank you for listening and support the show for the love of God. And all things dirty on the hood of the car. <laughs> Uh, shout out the social media, baby. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page. Oh, yeah? On Twitter and on Instagram. Yes, and ignore the pictures of the hood sex. <laughs> yes. Also, you can find us right at New York's Best Talk.com. Get on over there. The show page has got every single show, even run us the live stuff. And we've got a chat room over there. You can even share pictures. And I'm thinking about going over there starting Monday, and I'll just share out all these these pictures of all my previous exploits. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that too. Yes. Yeah. I don't care. They're getting child support from me. I might as well, you know, make them famous. And uh, once again, uh, finally, uh, thank you to the listeners of HTLA out there. Sharon Chesley, the one, the only first lady of HTLA, Devlon Crawford, uh, Phil DeYoung. Uh, God, Greg Howe, uh, Phyllis Griffiths, uh, Tom Grote, the list goes on and on. It doesn't end. There's just too many to list. I thank you all for listening. You guys have a great weekend. We will catch you Monday. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
hey, there it is. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, there it is. Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it may be to you. Of course, to us right here, right now in uh, downtown New York. It's 5 p.m. Eastern. That's right, and you're listening to HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. And, of course, what do we got for you today? Well, hey, we got your coffee and cigarettes. Yes, that's right, the Monday mocha. Well, get the get the week started off right. That's what we'll do. So you are here with the Crash Man, CJT, in HTLA Studio 2. And, of course, along with me is the one, the only Kissy Springer in the booth pushing the buttons, making us go. This show is brought to you by... The fine folks of PreSonus, that's right, she's pushing buttons on that 2442 digital broadcast mixer, and hey, PreSonus.com, check them out today, or what? Well, what do we got for you on the show today, anyway? Well, we got a lot, actually. Mr. Bezos defending working conditions at Amazon, for one. Also, the death toll is rising in that Bangkok bomb blast. Yes. Huh. Damn Bangkok bombs. What are you going to do? Also today, we got Donald Trump looking bored like the rest of us at jury duty. That's right. We got some Trump 2016 news rolling out for you today. And the tongue-rolling myth now has been totally debunked. Hey, remember when you roll your tongue in half like that, that, I don't know, it looks like a pussy or something? I don't know what the hell it is. <clears throat> well, yeah, anyway, it's genetic. Yeah, that's right. Yes, we've got all that and so much more today, so hey, why don't you come on in, grab that cup, have a seat, and definitely light one up, gang. It is your coffee time. That's right, it is your coffee time. 502 Eastern in the big city of Manhattan right now. Yeah. And uh yeah, we got uh, Phil DeYoung. I think he's buying vying for that uh, weather uh, man job or something, but uh currently in Grand Rapids, Michigan, it is 86 and cloudy. There you go. Don't say we didn't tell you. And don't blame Frankie McDonald for giving you the right weather cuz that wasn't him, that was Phil DeYoung. That's right. Just uh, give me a second here. I gotta. Oh, oh there we go. Ah, much better. No, just we're 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 doing a whole bunch of upgrades to the studio uh, this week. So, well, the place is in kind of shambles right now, believe it or not. But uh, hey, we're still here for you. Uh, and speaking of upgrades, of course, we got to mention uh, pre-Sonus. We got some more pre-Sonus gear in the studio this week. Well, it's not in yet, but it's it's getting there. You want to look at anything in the audio realm, whether digital or analog, the pros always go to freesonus.com. Also, this show is brought to you by, of course, the fine folks at HTLA's. Uh, well, no, it's not HTLA's yet. We're going to buy them soon. Yes, Tim Hortons, New York City. Now with those eight fine locations in the city to serve all your coffee and baked goods needs. That's right, Tim Hortons. Always fresh, gang. And, uh... <clears throat> Kissy brought me in a, a cup today. Mm. Whew. Yeah, she brought it in about, uh, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 minutes ago, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she brought it in, and, uh, and, and man, you know, it, it is my dark roast, but the, it's, it's this, this new coffee machine they've got here. Um, some bitch. It, it's, it's hot. I'm telling you, man, when it comes out of there, like, she came in and I, Took it and I took a sip and just about burned my damn lips right off. But uh, gotta say, gotta say, the coffee maker is much better. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the one, the only Leanne Thomas to the HTLA live chat, of course, today, along with uh, our favorite topless intern and, of course, uh, weatherman Phil DeYoung. 
with your uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan weather right there. And, uh, of course, our weather here in Manhattan right now, we're looking at 88 degrees and cloudy in Central Park right now. Uh, with a low tonight of 75, and, uh, well, hey, you know, I, I think between uh, my little reports here of, of New York and, and Phil's little reports of, of Grand Rapids, I, eh, I think we pretty much got weather covered. We don't need Frankie anymore. But, of course, I don't get to make that call, so. <sighs> oh, well. I'll just drink my coffee and smoke my cigarettes and carry the hell on. And carrying the hell on today, of course, uh, in addition to Kissy in the booth pushing those buttons, making us go today, we've also got our guest slash co-host. Yes, our first one comes to us live from the beautiful Mill Bay Film and Television Production Studios in downtown Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada. The one, the only Louis Lawless is in the house. Louis, are you there? My film, Unrepented, did very well in Europe. Uh, right. Okay. That that's always a good thing, and uh, we're we're glad to hear it. Yeah, and I finally figured out how to uh, edit. Always a plus, especially you know when you know you've devoted your entire life to filmmaking. Sure, sex yeah. is only the tip of the iceberg. Well, you know, and that's good advice any time. Yeah, we, we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. Right, and we didn't. No, but yeah, hmm. I'm I'm just gonna call it as all good because uh, you know if you had one we we'd never would have gotten you for this bloody show. Yeah. Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on <clears throat> on the show? Well, <laughs> 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 uh, you know I'm, I'm gonna say uh, fill your boots. It, it doesn't seem to matter anymore. Kissy is uh, seems to be on that button all the time now. Even on last Thursday's show, when of course uh, we got the, the the green light as it were to go ahead and. Uh, unload the cussing and uh, of course then she started beeping you so I, I, I guess it's all good uh, <laughs> oh yes and the cackling man is here <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes the cackling man the one the only Gilbert Gottfried coming to us from about eight blocks down the street here from studio two in downtown Manhattan of course and uh <clears throat> well, Gilbert, uh, how how are you doing today? You, 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 are you are you good? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Saturday night at about uh, four in the morning, you weren't looking too good. No. <laughs> you, you were looking a little rough, actually. So. Uh, what the fuck? Well, you were, man. What can I say? I'm ready. Okay. Well, do your intro then. And this is I f- that up. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, everything seems status quo here. Yes. Uh, so I guess that means we can uh, get on rolling in with the, the show today. And, of course, um, well, I don't think, uh, yeah, I, I'm just, no, I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about it. We'll just, we'll just carry on like nothing happened. Yes. Yeah. You know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawless. Yeah, don't worry. We'll pay you to listen to our bullshit. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well... Welcome to the Monday Mocha Gang. Hope your Monday's going as absolutely sad and horrendous as ours is. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, if if you think your Monday's going sad so far, yes. you know, uh, at least you don't work for Amazon. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, oh, and, and Intern has just informed us he is getting his Marlboro Smooth 100s, baby. <laughs> Well, no, and, and that's an important thing, Gilbert. Yes. You know, and I got to say, and, and, and they don't pay us uh, for any any uh, promotions or anything else, but I got to say, you know, for just about the finest hand-tooled Corinthian tobacconist products you can buy, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I got to, you know, take the old cowboy hats off to Marlboro. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, well, you know, when, when I was in Canada, of course, yes. you know... Uh, well, my cigarette of choice, of course, was the uh, the the du, du Maurier. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, yes, the microphone is so good you can hear the tobacco burn. <laughs> now, when I was in Canada, of course, you know, I, I, I used to smoke these things called du Maurier. Yes, and. Uh, yeah, they were they were good. I smoked them for about twenty years or so. Before that, well, actually, you want to hear a funny story? Yes. When I was a kid, yes. Okay, I was like eleven years old. 
um, me and my my little organized criminals. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there was a, a group of four or five of us, and we used to we used to go into a local food store, which of course sold cigarettes. Yes. Yeah, we used to go in there with our Adidas bags. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Remember those? Good old Adidas. Uh, they used to have these bags. They were vinyl Adidas bags, and if you uh, yes. if you had one of these in school, you were cool. If you didn't, you suck. <laughs> Anyway, we go we go in there. We we all had our Adidas bags and whatnot. Yes. And, uh, you know, we we go in and and uh, you know we go over by the. They had this kind of U shaped magazine rack in the middle of all the the cashier lineouts at the food store. Yes. And, and this U shaped magazine rack. You know, the, the, the four or five of us used to go in there after school and and go read. You know, uh, okay, it was Playboy. <laughs> Yeah, we go in and read the Playboys and whatnot, and then we decided one day, you know, these Adidas bags are feeling mighty light. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just might be time to, I don't know, put something in them. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, me and my little uh, organized crime network. Yes. We, <laughs> yeah. We of course uh, embarked on a, a, a on a, it, it was a, it was a whole spree. Yes, it really was. I mean, you know, we we had a down the street from the the food store about three blocks. There was an open field there with an old abandoned shack, and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, shack was you know the the crime lord's townhouse. And, uh, <laughs> You know, so so we'd uh, we'd go up every day after school to the the, the food store, yes. and and we'd go in with our Adidas bags because we're carrying books and stuff because we're all smart from school and things. <laughs> yeah. And nobody looked the other way. And of course, it's long before they ever had you know cameras and, yes. and all that kind of stuff, right? So we'd go in there, and man, every day the five, four or five of us a day were loading up cartons of cigarettes and Playboy magazines. <laughs> you know. And it, it, it was stunning to me because, you know, we go in there every day, same time every day, about 3.15, and we roll in there. And uh, we go in there, and we, we, we go and we, we've got our Adidas bags, but nobody seems to notice that we're when we're leaving, we look like the guys from Heat coming out of the bank. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All the bags are, like, you know, packed solid and square yes. and, <laughs> you know... Yeah, what, one of the smaller kids in my, my posse, of course, is, you know, struggling to drag the thing out the effing door, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, it was, you know, two weeks. Well, I'm going to say, no, nah, I'm going to say, no, nah, uh, shit, I'm going to say, like, yeah, I'm going to say three, <sighs> three weeks. That's what I'm going to say. Yes. I'm going <laughs> to... Well, you know, I got to get these stories straight, you know, because, you know, I might get questioned about them later, you know. <laughs> so about three weeks later, of course, we were, you know, we're, we're in our clubhouse one day after school, after the, you know, the latest load we brought home. Yes. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, sure enough, we're sitting on stacks of, of Playboy and Penthouse. Yeah. You know, like stacks of them. Like, like seriously, we must have had about 500 issues. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, the cigarettes. God, we, we, we had a whole wall stacked with cartons. <laughs> just, just stacked. But, you know, me being, you know, 11 years old and not having a clue about cigarettes, you know, I... Yes. Well, I, I started smoking these things called Player's Navy Cut. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and Player's Navy Cut this is made by a company called John Player's uh, whatever. Yes. Yeah, some Canadian frickin' tobacco lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, these things, uh, you know, li I didn't know anything, of course. Yes. You know, so I, I open these up and, and I pull one out and I'm smoking it and everything else. And, yeah, I'm getting all these bits of tobacco in my mouth. Yes. You know? <laughs> And one of the kids, Don's, I'm like, one of the kids is, he's smoking, I don't know, some bloody, you know, long girl 100s menthol smoke. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's over there, he's like, like, what? He says to me, why do you smoke those? Yes. And I'm like, well, why do you smoke that? And he says, well, because it's got a filter on it and I don't get tobacco in my mouth. <laughs> so. 
So there you go. So uh, that's when I clued in and, and started smoking, uh, what the hell was it? Player's Light, I think it yes. was. I uh, smoked those for a while. And then and then I got ballsy one day and tried Export A Green. And if, uh, if you're not Canadian, you wouldn't have a clue. But if you are Canadian, you know, well, you'll want to give me the Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> Well, the reason being, of course, is that it is the strongest mf and cigarette you can buy in North America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, this this stuff when you when you light it up, Gilbert. Yes. When when you light one of these cigarettes up, in, instead of like the usual gray kind of bluey smoke that comes up from the end of them. Yes. Yeah. No, this black apparition of death comes up and says, "Yes." <laughs> Now, now, when you when you're smoking that, yes. yeah, you know you're gonna die. Yes, that's right. <laughs> there it is. But but suffice it to say, you know, after our our crime spree there went on uh, unchecked, like it had to be the whole bloody school year. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, uh, people are just stupid and oblivious. <laughs> but. Uh, I don't know. I, I moved away after that, moved to another area of town, and, uh, well, of course, there was all new kids, and they were just too stupid to train. <laughs> so I, uh, I I continued my life of crime solo. <laughs> and, uh, well, I guess time caught up with me because that's when the private store detectives were first introduced. <laughs> uh, Oh yeah, and this this guy this this guy was like. Uh, that's why I hate Frankie McDonald. This guy was like Frankie McDonald. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, he was. He he was. Uh, he he had this kind of thing. Yes. You know, every time he would talk at the end of a sentence, he'd be like. Hmm? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, not even kidding. This guy, yes. uh, you know, he, I'm, I'm, I'm going out, and of course, I got my coat filled with, I don't know, a couple of Playboys and a, a pack or two of smokes. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going out of the, the place, and it's set up the same as the other food store. It had the, the U shape, yes. you know, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing my thing, and, and I'm, I'm heading out of the store. And as soon as I get out the door, yes. as soon as I get out the door, boom, I get this hand on my, my rear right shoulder. Yes. <laughs> And he doesn't stop me. He continues to walk with me outside. Yes. And he's, he's like, well, uh, uh, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> he's, no, no, you, you missed it. He went, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and he does this, and he, and he does this <laughs> thing. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah, long and the short, it, it's, a, it's a store security guard. Busts my ass, calls my mom down to the store. Yes. And... Uh, you know, at the end of it, we're walking out, and Mom's like, "Well, I hope you learned your lesson." And I'm like, "Yeah, actually, I have. You know, um, it's time to quit your life of crime when you get caught by that moron." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just thought I'd share that with you today. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why it just came out of my ass. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's the famous story about Jerry Lee Lewis. You heard that story, haven't you? I know I have, Gilbert. Yes. Yeah, see, shut up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, we don't need Jerry Lee until at least after the first commercial break, Louie. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving on today, gang, we got uh, big Amazon news. That's right, Mr. Bezos defending his working conditions at Amazon. That's right, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos says that an article published by the New York Times Portraying the difficult work environment at the online retailer doesn't describe the Amazon I know, he says. Well, of course, that's why, that's clearly because he doesn't work at any of the warehouses. Yes. No, he works up in the sexy corporate building in Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've been in there. I think you have too, you little uh, Jew. Yes. Yeah, you've, you've been in there. Yeah, it's a nice, nice place. Yes. And uh, all the babes run around in tight skirts. I mean... <laughs> You know, who, uh, you know, tell me, uh, who doesn't want to work around that? Yes. You know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, that's not the Amazon he knows, apparently. <laughs> well, the article reports that Amazon employees must work long hours and are encouraged to openly criticize coworkers' ideas. Yeah, your idea sucks. <laughs> 
I don't know. I think that'd be a good place to work. Fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, as one former employee quoted in the article notes, quote, Amazon is where overachievers go to feel bad about themselves. <laughs> now, the report also de- details a seeming lack of empathy for employees' health-related issues. One excerpt details a female employee with breast cancer who was placed on a, quote, performance improvement plan. <laughs> Yes, because apparently personal issues were affecting her work. Now, yes. it's important to notice note here uh, that this woman with the breast cancer, yes. uh, she was white, so Black Lives Matter, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now, in a memo to employees sent late Sunday and obtained by us, Bezos defended the culture at Amazon and encouraged employees who heard of similar stories to contact him personally. Yeah, right. <laughs> No, no, not contact him personally. Contact human resources. Yes. <laughs> Even if it's rare or isolated, our tolerance for any such lack of empathy needs to be zero, Be- Bezos writes in a memo. Bezos also questions the article's suggestion that Amazon created a, quote, soulless dystopian work environment. <laughs> Power tends to corrupt. Yeah, yeah. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, there you go. So you got this corrupt bastard saying it ain't true. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, the soulless dystopian work environment, of course, citing the competition among tech companies to hire employees. The people we hire here are the best of the best, he writes. You are recruited every day by other world-class companies, and you can work anywhere you want. Many of the allegations sound consistent with things that former employees have told me about the company, says Sukarita Muprul Kaladi. <laughs> yes, well, at least we know ISIS is alive and well at Amazon. <laughs> well, she's an Amazon analyst. Oh, okay, so she's not at Amazon. She's an analyst with Forrester Research. <laughs> But that's not surprising, she noted, as Amazon's expectations aren't that different from those of investment banks, which is where Bezos worked before he launched his company. Amazon, which turned 20 this year, has extensive networks of former employees. As you can imagine, all of us alumni were passing the story around this weekend, says Eric Heller, CEO and founder of Marketplace Ignition a strategy and branding consulting firm based in Atlanta. For Heller, his seven-year stint at Amazon in the 1990s was like being in an extremely rigorous MBA program, he says. (laughs) You can complain that the tests are hard and the workload hard, but in the end, you wouldn't change it. It's very challenging, but you learn a ton, and it launches you into your next position, Heller said. Yeah, right, another corporate doofy working at the corporate building. (laughs) Let's talk to uh, Alejandro, who fills and packs your boxes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, in his experience, Amazon is a great fit for a certain type of person who thrives on intensity and being around incredibly smart, driven people and girls with tight skirts. <laughs> no one is forced to be there, Heller said. But he admits many eventually move on to get better work-life balance. Maybe now they've got two or three kids and they want a different lifestyle, he said. In that way, he added, it's like working for a consulting firm. Why don't you come and work for me? (laughs) That was a mistake on my part. Oh, did you work there? Yes. Yeah? Uh, I don't know, Louie. I I didn't really picture you so much working at Amazon. I pictured you more as a greeter at Walmart. (laughs) Well, many go on to start companies of their own and end up hiring former Amazonian employees. If you find these great people that you want to work with again and you start building a company around it, says Heller, who has multiple Amazon alumni on his staff, Amazon's success in hiring people, despite what it seems to be a less-than-nurturing culture, is actually good news in a time when tech companies complain about the difficulty of finding qualified workers, says Malpru Kodali. (laughs) Now, there's obviously a lot of great talent out there in the world. If you look hard enough, you find those people, she said. There you go, and, well, that's the goddamn story. (laughs) 
I I should have just sat here for the last ten minutes and just said lies, 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 yes. lies, <laughs> lies, lies, lies. Amazon is no, I'm gonna say it. The Third Reich. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, moving on today. Uh, of course, I'm getting the oh oh yes, I'm getting the wrist tapping from Pissy Springer. <laughs> Yeah, so we do have to go for that first commercial break. But don't worry. When we come back, we're going to tell you all about the millions dead in Bangkok. <laughs> That's right. We'll be back in two, gang. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions? Abundant with rich, fertile soil. What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended, ground, and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness, then brewed in small batches and always served fresh, Within 20 minutes, just the way you like it. Now, what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. Automatic freshness, softness, and static control has never been easier with the Bounce Dryer Bar. I just stick it to the inside of my dryer and I never have to remember... Old Spice Body Spray makes you smell like power! It's so powerful it sells itself in other people's commercials! You smell like outdoor freshness. You smell like power? Yeah, I do! Power! When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And, and the room they gave us, it was, was beautiful. A broom closet. But the, but best the worst part was the shower. My, my wife, wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towels. Shower curtain defined, defined that whole vacation, whole vacation for her. For. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1. And and I think there were complaints about it. Yeah. Where I think, like, they were saying, like, they were going to censor it or stop in in Britain, saying this is against the laws of nature. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. Welcome back to Deviations in Nature. <laughs> that's right. If you want to, all right, calm the frick down. Yes. <laughs> Take it crazy because all of a sudden nobody loves them. I know, Louie, I know. <laughs> what are you going to do? What That's are you gonna... a famous story about Jerry Lee Lewis. You heard that story, yeah. haven't you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> sitting behind his desk in Paramount uh, talking with big executives and, and TV people and all of a sudden the chick pops up underneath and wipes off her mouth and walks out the door and <laughs> Jerry doesn't have an eye. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's it's just it's just great. I love that, Louis. Thank you. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories, anyway. Right. Same thing. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, uh, Gilbert. Uh, why don't you yes. uh, give the folks your Instagram, uh, Twitter stuff? Yeah. On Twitter. Yeah. At Real Gilbert ACP. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know what the ACP is, but uh, anything else? And on Instagram. There you go. Gilbert Pod Free. Oh. P O D F R I E D. <laughs> right. You see, it's kind of a pun on the last name. Ah, no. <sighs> Yeah, okay. Well, hey, gang. Welcome back to the big show. Of course, your coffee and cigarettes, Monday Mocha. That's right. For this Monday, the 17th of August, 2015. Uh, it's 5.32 p.m. right now. 89 degrees Central Park. Uh, mostly sunny skies. Going to get down to 75 tonight, but that doesn't freaking help. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's that's all I got to say about that. Yes. <laughs> Well, I we, remember uh, being on your radio show in Chicago. Oh, yeah. I, I, so many years ago, yeah. Yeah, and, and I remember we, we hung out afterwards and had a wild time. Oh, well, we we do pretty much uh, most shows, you little weirdo. <laughs> well, what the big deal is, God, and it, man, at 4 o'clock uh, Saturday morning, was it, I think it was? Yes. Yeah, you were just... I, I thought you were going to, like, vomit and diarrhea poo all at the same time. <laughs> and I remember, too, mm-hmm. when we were in the alleyway uh-huh. and uh, zipped up. Right. Um, There was this one, you know, sleazy-looking guy who walked by who was staring at us, and you turned around... And, yeah, I mean, he was a, what? What? What's your problem? And you said, like, <laughs> you don't give a shit. <laughs> no. Dude, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why you find that so damn funny because uh, it's some fucker in an alley. What yes. Is he? <laughs> why the hell would I, you know, he's, he's lucky he left there with his teeth, you know. <laughs> But you know, I guess that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do that. You know, let's let's dance, bitch. And, yeah. and I remember, and this is why I feel I have a real connection with you, because in the alleyway, I, when that's when that's the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> she she <laughs> bent over it in the alleyway, and you inserted yourself, <laughs> and and then she started to blow me. And my erection was kind of a semi-erection because I kept looking at you. Yeah, why? So what? when when you when you're standing there trying to get a blowjob and looking at it's really hard, <laughs> and then I remember <laughs> uh, I had a hotel room. Oh yeah. So yeah. we both went up there. Yeah. And you went first. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Why, why, why? You are my opening act. No, no, I'm your hero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right, I am your hero. And uh, it's just been passed to me, yes, the, the secret note in the uh, Congress-Senate hearing. <laughs> yes. But, uh, we've got the one, the only Leanne in the house, and of course it was her birthday the other day. Yes. And uh, we missed it. So uh, Gilbert's prepared his little song there to, to sing for her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go to uh, the Brock Favors and the Frankie McDoodle, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, why don't you unload there, Gilbert? Give it to her. Take me to your heart. Show me where to start. <laughs> Let me play the part of your first love. All the stars are right. Let us make a wish tonight, my love. Pity those who wait, <laughs> trust in love to fate, finding out too late that they've they lost, lost it. it. There you go. Never let it go. You will never know the ways of love. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, Leanne. He basically just told you you'll never have a boyfriend. Yes. Yeah, no, I just, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Although, I don't know. Everybody's got to be freaking blind. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'd 
like to have that as my slogan in, in life. Yeah. Yeah, see, Gilbert, uh, everybody's got to be freaking blind Godfrey. <laughs> there you go. Well, listen, before we move on... That uh, is only the tip of the iceberg. That, that's right, Louis. Thank you very much for your um, um, abstinence lesson for today. <laughs> yes. It's about, it's about fucking time. Move on. Move on. See, Kissy's not beeping him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have to move on, but uh, before we do, of course, we have to bring you the uh, HTLA Traffic Copter 1 and the, uh, well, the NAACP Token Black Man at HTLA. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, the one the only Brock Favors with your traffic. Brock, take it. Hello, everybody out there. This is Brock Favors with Traffic on the Ones. Chad Armstrong is out sick today, so I am filling in for my usual land reports. And uh, I'm up here at the chopper, but I got to tell you guys, I am loving the view. <laughs> oh, oh, my God! Oh, oh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we are um uh we are over the ten, and it's massively clogged down there like a pint of maple syrup on a cool November morning. And we do. Oh, oh God, yeah, we're gonna die in this motherfucker! Oh, oh, oh my God! Woo! 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 Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I am. Uh, I am very sorry, folks. <laughs> it's a little bit of a bumpy ride up here. We are now approaching the 405, uh, where the left lane is blocked by a mattress. So somebody is uh, going to be doing a little return to Ikea later today. You know what I'm saying? Oh, no, please! Oh, God, yeah! Oh, get me out this motherfucking dirt machine right now! Oh, no, black people ain't meant to be in the sky! We ain't meant to be in the sky, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my! <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, well, a four or five is up right now. Ain't nobody going down this. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, folks. I'm very sorry, about the, but I'm losing my up here. Actually, you have every right to. We're about to crash. Oh, yeah, me. Well, once again, HTLA and its affiliate companies would like to uh, offer its condolences to the Favors family. <laughs> yes, that was uh, Brock Favors with your traffic update for, I believe, California. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and you know, you, you won't find that anywhere else, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. You know, you, nowhere, any of our competition here in New York City, uh, none of them can put it up that we cover the traffic for Los Angeles. <laughs> But, of course, we do, and, uh, well, that makes us special. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Gilbert, give us a little bit of uh, Jerry Lewis and Hervé Villachez before we go to Frankie McDonald with the weather. Here's Jerry Lewis directing Hervé <laughs> <laughs> Villachez. All right. Hervé! Hervé, can you act with the realistic person acting? I ask me in France, we admire you. Oh, thank you, you short midget person. <laughs> we do not like that uh, midget. Oh, I'm sorry, little person with the thing with the thing. <laughs> Oh, and and how about, uh, oh, okay, I can't put it off anymore. All right. Well, uh, before we get into the stupid weather, (laughs) yes, I'll remind the folks uh, in and around the New York area here that it is 89 degrees Central Park right now under mostly sunny skies, and of course... uh, well, our our man in Grand Rapids there is just giving us the weather update. It's uh, now 84 degrees, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that's about as close to the real weather today as you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> now I got to do it. Yes. Uh, 
Without further ado, uh, here is, of course, the one, the only HTLA meteorologist, Frankie McDonald, uh, coming to us uh, live while he's not actually under the stairs right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with his 19-inch monitor, he is, of course, out and about some bloody place. <laughs> Uh, here's the the one, the only Frankie McDonald with your Monday Outlook. This is Frankie McDonald, my own TV station live in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Massive blizzards headed towards Maine on Tuesday, January the 27th, 2015. It's going to bring 30 plus centimeters of snow, especially in Bangor, Maine and Portland, Maine as well. It's going to bring a lot of snow. Winds are going to be very strong. It's going to be Zero visibility is going to be blown and drift of snow, which is 6 to 12 plus inches of snow for the state of Maine, including Bangor, Maine, and Portland, Maine. Since a low pressure system, system is going to develop off the east coast of the United States, then a low pressure system is going to intensify and move up the east coast of the United States. That's going to cause blizzard conditions in Portland, Maine, Bangor, Maine. Louis and Maine, and the rest of the state of Maine on Tuesday, January 27th, 2015. <laughs> it's going to bring blizzard conditions, howling winds, blow the drift of snow, white old conditions, and zero visibility. It's going to be very strong winds, blow the drift of snow for the state of Maine, including Portland, Maine as well. It's going to be a Intense snowstorm with blizzard conditions on Tuesday, January 27th, 2015, in May. <laughs> People in May, be prepared. If you went to boots ready, if you went to jackets ready, hats, gloves, scarf, and ski pants is ready. Yeah. Order your pizzas and order your Chinese food. Buy cases of Pepsi, buy cases of Coke. Do your grocery shopping. Don't wait till the last minute. Do it right now. <laughs> if your iPad search, if your iPod search, if your cell phone search, if your laptop search, if your tablet search, if your 3G4G app ready. When it grow outside, don't walk too far. If you don't like the blizzard, don't go outside. Okay. Because it's going to be <laughs> blizzard conditions. When you drive the car, Take your time, drive the car, slow down, so you don't get in car accidents. Make sure to have your shovels ready, snow scoops ready, snow blowers ready, snow blasts ready, and salt trucks ready as well. Uh, Drink yeah. lots of green tea, white tea, red tea. Drink lots of green tea to give you work. Have your furnaces ready. Turn on your furnaces to keep the house warm. Since it's going to be a massive blizzard for Maine on Tuesday, January 27, 2015. Uh -huh. Okay, you good? Thanks. Uh, Frankie, that was If your... anybody lives in Maine, <laughs> be prepared for a massive blizzard on Tuesday, January 27, 2015. Best luck to you people in the state of Maine. Be prepared for a massive blizzard on Tuesday. Take care. Stay safe. Don't get caught in a massive blizzard. Stay warm. Be safe. No, he, he done now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kissy gives us the official word. Uh, Frankie is done for yes. today. Uh, <laughs> no, I guess we should be uh, thankful a bit today. Yes. You know, he he was at least in the right year. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You know why, Chris? Because you're such a, a control freak. You don't want anyone to tell you what to do. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'll, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 over, Phil. You can listen now. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he, he just said in the chat room, you know, is, is it over? You know, yeah. <laughs> well, everything that could go wrong goes wrong. Yeah. Well, of course, it's Frankie McDonald. Yeah. <sighs> well, it's not awful, but but just not good. No. No, no, and I, I really, I don't, I don't know why, in any kind of reality, the 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 the, the higher ups here at this stupid station seem to think that this guy is just the shiznit. I don't know. <clears throat> I 
Well, whatever. We got to move on. There's a bunch of dead in Bangkok collecting flies and making maggots. That's right. The death toll is rising in the Bangkok bomb blast. You know that's going to be a new drink at the bars this weekend, right? <laughs> yeah, man. Give me four Bangkok bomb blasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Bangkok, a deadly bomb blast today rocked a downtown shopping and tourism hub here during the evening rush hour, killing at least 18 people and injuring scores more, authorities said. It sounded like thunder, says Alexander Holtz, an American filmmaker who works in the area. Thank God it was somebody I could actually, you know, oh, I don't know, what's what's the word I'm, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, here we go. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at I got, I, they're actually moving shit in the studio while I'm trying to do this. <laughs> Just stick that over there and, and get the frick out of here. I'm working. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, it's good to, to see an American name, unlike the ones that are sure to be coming up shortly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alexander Hotz, uh, an American filmmaker who works in the area. We were sitting in the office, and at first we thought it was just an amazingly loud rainstorm coming through. And one of our Thai interns came back upstairs and told us that things were going crazy. A BBC correspondent said there were body parts scattered everywhere. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's the nummy stuff I love reporting here. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, scattered everywhere, indicating a bombing. People near the Irwan Shrine, a Hindu religious site where the explosion took place, were hit by full force of the blast, the BBC reported. Burned motorbikes could be seen on the road with hashed, uh, no, charred skeletons still sitting on them. <laughs> wow. Yes, yeah, wow. Police initially said that they found a suspicious suspicious object near the blast site and were concerned about a second explosion. Later, National Police Chief Samyet Pupum Rang. <laughs> yes, Samyet Pupum Rang told the Associated Press the object had been determined to be harmless. And then, boom. Well, it's good to know you can trust the authorities over there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we checked it out. It's harmless. Boom. <laughs> well, at least 18 people have been confirmed dead and over 117 injured, the Associated Press reports, citing emergency officials. The Bangkok, Bangkok Post, citing the Royal Thai Police, put the death toll at 19. No group has immediately claimed responsibility for the blast. The Post said an improvised explosive device placed inside the Shrine Complex de detonated at 6.55 p.m. local time. The newspaper said the scale of the explosion set motorbikes and taxis ablaze near the Raj Prasong intersection. <laughs> ah, yes, I remember my, my, my nights in Raj Prasong. <laughs> yes. Hey, that should be what we do now, Gilbert. Yes. Uh, after the show on, say, Friday, we'll we'll fly over to, to Bangkok. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get wasted over at the Raj Prasong intersection. <laughs> <laughs> well, Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister... Oh, you know, this is going to be a good one. Yes. <laughs> Prawit Wong Swan... <laughs> condemned the bombing and expressed condolences to the families of the dead and injured. He told the Post that it was too soon to say if the attacks were politically motivated. He also wanted to extend his condolences as well to Brock Favors' family. <laughs> but it was clear... Um, oh, yes. He also told the Post that it was soon to say if the attacks were politically motivated, they would let us know. But it was clear that the perpetrators intended to destroy the economy and tourism because it occurred in the heart of Bangkok's business district. Tourists are hanging around Bangkok's red light district. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, who, who the hell's going to the business district at yes. night? Uh, <laughs> 
Well, the White House also condemned the attack and said U.S. officials would remain in close contact with Thai authorities investigating the blast. A statement from the National Security Council spokesman Ned Price extended our deepest condolences to all those affected by the explosion and Brock Favors' family. (laughs) While such attacks are rare here, uh, there have been similar incidents in recent months. In February, a small homemade pipe bomb exploded near Bangkok's shopping mall. In March, grenades were tossed in front of the Central Criminal Court building in Bangkok. And in April, seven people were injured in the parking lot blast in the tourist island of Koh Samui. (laughs) There you go. It was not clear Monday why the shrine was targeted. More than 90% of Thailand's 66 million people are Buddhist. The Hindus are making a tiny fraction of the rest. About 5% of the population is Islamic. (laughs) And there has been some religious unrest involving Islamic separatists in southern Thailand in recent years. Thailand experienced a military coup in May of 2014. The government was dissolved and replaced by a military-dominated national legislature. The current prime minister, General... You know, I I would sooner say Klingon names than than this. (laughs) General Priyut... Chan Ocha. <laughs> yes, he has cracked down on dissident and banned the criticism of his government and shoots many people in the head. <laughs> well, Anna Malika, a Thai American auditor? Yeah, auditor, apparently, not an editor. Yes. <laughs> well, she said she was in exercise class when the blast hit. Oh. Well, that seems like a fine alibi. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we heard uh, the most almighty bang, Malika said. Really? Because the the first eyewitness, uh, yeah, he thought it was just a heavy rainstorm? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And you thought it was, yeah, okay, bullshit. Yes, we heard the most almighty bang, Malika said. Most of us thought it was something wrong, but the instructor told us it was probably just a car crash or something like that. Well, minutes later, we saw people running and panicking outside the windows. Richard Sri Kurlija, five times fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, he told the BBC he was walking to a mall next to the shrine when he heard the blast. There was total chaos, he said, and that area is usually very, very crowded as it's in the middle of the city and usually very packed. A local hotel is full of injured people, he said. Uh, yeah, that's 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 ISIS right there. That's, uh, yeah, they, well, they, they always go for the maximum kill. Yes. You know? Yeah, so there that is, and, uh, well, you know, it, it doesn't get any better than that, really. You know, you go to the shrine, boom. <laughs> uh, the intern says that the uh, general also condemned criticism of his name. So, uh, yeah, general, uh, I got something for you, bitch. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just try and say your name properly, and that'll be enough of an insult. Yes. Uh, there you go. Well, moving on today, we got Trump news. Yes, the 2016 mogul. (laughs) Leaving all the other lying sacks of shit in the dust. That's right. Well, he was uh, looking bored today, like the rest of us, at jury duty, apparently. Yeah. Well, the law has finally caught up with Donald Trump, and he is serving his time. Trump reported for jury duty today at the state Supreme Court building in Lower Manhattan. Uh, the Republican presidential frontrunner, who was hosting helicopter rides at the Iowa State Fair over the weekend. <laughs> yeah, look at all you folks. Isn't it great to be rich? <laughs> yeah, when we're done here, I'm going to fly away in this and keep flying around because I am rich. <laughs> and you're not. And I'm rich. <laughs> Well, over the weekend there, hosting those rides, he said he was happy to take the campaign break to perform perform his civic duty, showing the poor what they could have. (laughs) That's right. That's right. I'm rich. (laughs) 
Well, Trump arrived in a limousine to face a crowd dominated by scores of cameramen and reporters. He signed just a few autographs and shook some hands. It's my duty and I'm happy to do it, he said of his service before entering the courthouse. I'm ready. We'll see what happens. And if this uh, suspect is black, he's done. <laughs> Well, Trump had failed to appear several times in recent years, but he won't have to dig into his personal fortune to finance the $250 fine. Michael Cohen, special counsel to Trump, said the fine was waived when his boss checked in with the court. Cohen admitted Trump had failed to respond to previous summonses for court, but said that they were sent to addresses owned by the real estate titan, not his residence. They never made their way to Trump, Cohen said. Mr. Trump's failure to appear in previous jury requests was the result of the unified court system's error in the mailing address and not Mr. Trump's refusal to uphold his civic duty, Cohen said. The New York Times says it's impossible to know if you are being asked to serve when jury selection documents are sent to someone else's home. <laughs> Well, Donald Trump was one of hundreds of people scheduled to serve Monday. The rule is one day or if selected for a jury, one trial. The group was assured by Jury Assembly Supervisor Irene Lucarencia that no one would enjoy special treatment, Mr. Trump. <laughs> well, David Hamburger, 22 years old, was also called for jury duty Monday. He, Trump, seemed in deep thought about his campaign, Hamburger told New York's Daily News. He's a nice guy, a funny guy. He seemed pretty bored like the rest of us, and, uh, well, that's just the way it was, America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, putting his time in Monday wins Trump a free pass from jury duty for six years under the Donald's timeline. That would put him in his sec second presidential term. Trump, who could be nominating U.S. Supreme Court justices one day, has no interest in shirking his current judicial responsibilities. Quote, I'm looking forward to it, Trump said, while on a stump at the New Hampshire's last week. I think it's fun. <laughs> okay, now he's starting to show his crazy colors. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, that was a mistake on my part. Yeah, it would make sense that he was hanging out with you. <laughs> Actually, it, it totally would. So, I don't know, Gilbert, what do you think? Yes. Is that just a, 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 a Trump scam? Did he really shirk his responsibilities until he's in the uh, presidential limelight? Or, option number two, the idiots did have the address wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, it, it's hard to tell because, yes. you know, uh, on the one hand, yeah, it probably would be likely he would, uh, you know, jerk the, the, the jury duty. Yes. You know. <laughs> But then, as we all know, it's also very, very likely that, well, the court's just screwed up. <laughs> I think so. Well, moving on today, we've got uh, very, very important news. I don't know why this is actually here before the next story, which is actually an earthquake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. That's right. Uh, maybe this is something that, that our listeners are, are eagerly awaiting the outcome of. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, but here it is. Tongue rolling. Yes, the myth totally debunked. That's the, the big news. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, for anyone who can still probably proudly recall, one factoid learned in high school biology is that the ability to roll one's tongue is genetic. It's bad news if you learned it wrong, says John McDonald, an evolutionary biologist who is out to debunk what he calls a myth about the genetic roots of tongue rolling. God, buddy, get a job. <laughs> well, he says many of the undergrad students walk into class at the University of Delaware believing the skill is passed down through generations, and you can see why in textbooks like Biology for CXC. Quote, try rolling your tongue a long ways into a U-shape, the book reads. Some people can do this, others can't. Tongue rolling is caused by a dominant gene which we call T, Pretty specific, yet untrue, says McDonald. The misinformation began in 1940 when geneticist Alfred Sturvant wrote that tongue rolling was a genetic trait that relies on the dominant gene. His theory was debunked 12 years later by research Philip, uh, researcher Philip Matlock, who noted that in seven of 33 pairs of identical twins, one twin could roll his or her tongue, while the other one couldn't. 
1952 paper also noted that 65% of the population has a tongue-rolling ability. Girls, take note. (laughs) That ruled out the dominant gene theory. The Sturdivant paper uh, later backed down, and yet the belief remains so dominant, in fact, that McDonald says kids have written him fearing that they were adopted because they can't roll their tongue like their parents. (laughs) Well, today's modern science, yes. <laughs> of course, tells us that uh, you know that. Uh, well, that's that's absolutely not true. Uh, the belief remains that uh, because they okay, yes, uh, genetics play some role. However, McDonald points to a 1971 lab study that found non-identical twins were twice as likely to not share tongue rolling ability as identical ones which is additional evidence that there is some genetic influence still. Tongue rolling is not a simple genetic character, he writes. At the University of Delaware, despite this, tongue rolling is probably the most commonly used classroom example of a simple genetic trait in humans. Why don't the assholes talk about, oh, I don't know, hair color? (laughs) I don't know, we'll do this tongue rolling thing. This is is more... Yeah, how about just hair color, or eye color? God, the, the Jewish nose. You know, something. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Oh, good, Louie. It's good to see you're still awake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which which uh, woman are you married to or living with now? Uh, the, the same one. You know, it's... <laughs> I, I've, I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, try to get some harem of bevy of beauties, but uh, I always seem to fall square on my nose. Yeah, I do. But there you go. That's your uh, tongue rolling update. Uh, why we needed that then, I, I don't know. But thank you, Kissy, for that wonderful, wonderful story. And I hope that our listeners out there can now sleep easy. All right. Well, I mean, it's a pretty important thing. Yes. You've got to do that. <clears throat> well, moving on today in the news, magnitude 4 earthquake. Oh, okay, that's why it doesn't freaking matter. It's only a 4. <laughs> yes, it rocks the Bay Area. San Francisco today, a magnitude 4 earthquake rattled the San Francisco Bay Area before dawn Tuesday, though no damage or injuries were reported. Isn't that like a regular Tuesday there? <laughs> Well, the U.S. Geological Survey said the quake struck at 2.41 a.m. Pacific time. It was centered two miles northeast of Fremont in Alameda County City of more than 220,000 people, 30 miles south of what, southeast, I should say, of San Francisco. A magnitude 2.7 aftershock followed 15 minutes after the quake, then several smaller aftershocks rolled through the area. Commuter rail service was delayed for about 20 minutes in the morning rush while Bay Area Rapid Transit officials inspected tracks for possible damage. They said in a tweet, the 15 to 20 minute average delays system wide may be longer or shorter depending on the line. We're expecting tracks uh, due to the quake. Please be, or inspecting tracks, I should say, due to the quake. Please be patient. Uh, we felt it. Lots of calls coming in from nervous and scared residents, but no reports of damage at this time, the Fremont Police Department tweeted. Fremont Fire Dispatcher told us that the city received no calls during the quake. The rolling sensation of the quake was strong enough to wake residents and set dogs barking in San Fran, but it did not hit with the strong impact that rattled the region in August with the magnitude 6 from South Napa, which hit, of course, on August 24th, centered less than 70 miles from Fremont. It did kill one person, injured 200, and caused $400 million out of Arnold Schwarzenegger's pocket. (laughs) Now, Fremont is at the southern end of the Hayward Fault, which saw its most serious quake back in 1868. Although its magnitude isn't known, that quake killed 30 people and was known as the Great San Francisco Earthquake until the iconic magnitude 7.9 quake along the San Andreas Fault in 1906. We all remember that one. Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah that was that was a bitch, that one. Yes. <laughs> Well, gang, we're going to go for that second commercial break, but don't worry, when we come back, we've got all sorts of debauchery and, and, and disgusting sex positions. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's balls to the wind on this Monday show. Yes, <laughs> that's right. We're just uh, shaving them off, letting them loose. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, you you shave Gilbert, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. See, now everybody knows that Gilbert Godfrey shaves his balls. <laughs> See, and 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 right there, I think that yes, that's way more important than the tongue rolling thing. Yes, <laughs> it is. Anyway, gang, we'll be back in two. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio One. Good morning. Welcome to Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where fresh always tastes better. What can I make you this morning? How about our new flatbread breakfast paninis? Made fresh, just for you, with your favorite breakfast ingredients on maple or multigrain flatbread, then grilled to hot, melted perfection. Just $2.99. Who couldn't warm up to that? Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where quality really does meet value. When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the but the worst part was the shower. My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towel shower curtain defined that whole vacation for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. Let's do a brand new day. Let's step away from the bland and let the color fly. Let's get to the one store with more number one choices and match this or this without using too much of this. Then let's crack open a can and get to it. Paint? No. Let's do pow. Let's do this. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. Glidden Duo starts at a new lower price of $25.46 a gallon. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. On Twitter, at Real Gilbert, ACP. <laughs> well, well, thanks for, for bringing that in there. That was uh, yes. very, yes. Im- <laughs> very important. Yeah, that's awesome. How about uh, how about your Cary Grant uh, doing the Jewish canter? How about hey yo, Joe Joe, hey yo, Cary Grant as uh, <laughs> a canter? Yeah, that's hey yo, Joe Joe, hey yo, Misha Goy, hey yo. Well, you know when when I when I when I said do Cary Grant uh, canting, yes, you know you, you didn't have to actually say Cary Grant canting, yes, you know. <laughs> See, I think the folks got that from when I said do Cary Grant canting, you know. <laughs> Mister T would be proud of you. Uh, damn well he should. I'm white. <laughs> yeah. You would have loved the guy. He never drank. Never smoked. Did drugs. Nothing. He had only one obsession. Women. That was the women. That's right. He just pitied the fool, and yeah. If uh, you think that you were clever with women, he wouldn't stand a candle with this guy. No. Or Muhammad Ali was another one with women. I did two films with him. Yeah. Uh, we were walking. To, we were doing a, a big boxing movie uh, uh, with two or three hundred people in the stand, and he walked in and uh, had uh, beside him stood his uh, macho honcho. And those were all the Muslims in those days. They had those little thin ties and suits. Yeah, yeah. And he would point at the female. And he went and got him and gave him a note. And every 20 or 30 minutes, they would go into the dressing room. But they were only talking about negotiations, I'm sure. Right? Oh, yeah. It's all about the business, yeah. It's all about the business, <laughs> yes. 
Well, uh, Gilbert, uh, yes. we, we've actually got requests. They want your Jay Leno. Someone uh, read somewhere that you have a dick. Uh, can you show it to me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, welcome back to the biggest show. Of course, your coffee and cigarettes, Monday Mocha on HTLA Radio 1, New York's best talk. And you know, you can get all that HTLA has to offer unzipped, opened up, spread out, yes. <laughs> and completely shave. <laughs> yes, you can take a look at that pink over at New York's best talk.com. <laughs> And if you go to the show page right now, yes. that's right, right now, live. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you get yourself over there, New York's Best Talk dot com. Get over there live. Hit that show page. You're going to be in there. You're going to. There's the the chat room. People exchanging naked photos. <laughs> it's. Uh, Sex is only the tip of the iceberg. That's right, but it's a tip we'd like to explore. <laughs> Yeah, it's all about the sex. Yeah. That's right. I lived in I lived in Greenwich Village for a while when I first started as an actor. Yeah, but that was uh geez, nineteen sixty two? I don't think anybody from the old neighborhood would remember you. <laughs> no. I nearly got kicked out of a theater. I, went to, I can't remember what I saw about two weeks ago because I was booing and screaming. Yeah, yeah, that'll happen, especially if you're carrying a gun and a grenade. <laughs> We, we were five steps away from winning the Academy Award. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't. No, well, it's okay. And, and uh, the, the the thing you have to remember, Louie, is that you've been nominated 35 times. That's the important thing. Yes. You know. You think of old Gilbert here. He hasn't even seen the Academy Awards. <laughs> you know. No, I don't, because I asked him, I said, well, fly out here and I'll film you. Yeah, Gilbert will never let you film him. <laughs> no, it won't happen. That, that's why even to get him on this show, you know, he, he he stays in his apartment down the street. He doesn't come down to the studio here. <laughs> uh, I think it's, personally, I, I have some ideas about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that, uh, well, I'm just going to say it. You know, I, I think that my voice is so damn good on the air that he's actually sitting there right now masturbating. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, and, uh, and I've always admired Gilbert. The yes. you know the way you masturbate, and there's no heavy breathing. Yes, <laughs> you know that's that's pretty good. Uh, pop quiz, Seinfeld. Hey, can I see your dick? There you go. <laughs> <sighs> see, well, maybe he's not masturbating because I don't know how do you how do you drop your dick and do Seinfeld in an instant? How do you do that? <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> No, Frank and I were talking that your mother yeah. was in a movie. Yes, we've covered this. Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> yes. It's all over that. You, you, you know, you keep bringing that up. You should bloody apologize. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. What is my name? No, I'm not saying it again. <laughs> uh. Always when, always with a female having a relationship, married or single, yeah. it's always better that they do the leaving. Right. <laughs> if you do the leaving, it keeps it that lingering thing. You know what I mean? Yes, and hell, we wouldn't want to linger, would we? No. <laughs> uh, it's about fucking time. Move on. Mm. Move on. All right. <laughs> All right, well, moving on today, we got lots of stories to cover, and uh, hey, get ready for this. This, geez, I don't know why this is back here. This should be right up front of the tongue rolling thing. <laughs> That's right. Get ready for, uh, yeah, believe it or not, ads on the moon <laughs> well most people outside of asia are unfamiliar with a pakari sweet a japanese sports drink that tastes like gatorade and resembles well because they're japanese human sweat <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that might change when Picari Sweat becomes the first product advertised on the surface of the moon. <laughs> the music is fantastic. Oh, yeah? Oh, you got to hear it. You, you, you like the moon music, do you? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> That's, uh, Damn it, I got lost. H-T-L-A. Yeah, no, you're in the right place. <laughs> you are. 
Well, in the latter half of 2016, an American film devoted to space exploration, SpaceX, or an American firm, actually, not a film. Yeah. <laughs> SpaceX plans to land a rover on the moon. Among the rover's cargo, a can of Picari sweat, which will be left on the lunar plane near a giant crater named Berg. <laughs> well, the goal, as stated by Picari sweat, is for modern-day children to someday become astronauts and eventually drink, ew, its contents. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, now brace yourself for the era of lunar advertising. Picari Sweat's grandiose stunt is likely to become a trend, not an anomaly, as Picard would say. <laughs> Damn it, Mr. Data, it's an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> Wesley, come to my ready room. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Well, the U.S. firm designing the rover that will plop the Picari sweat can onto the moon expects more advertising dollars coming. Yes, that's right. The firm Astrobiotic tells us that the ads probably won't be the driving force funding non-government space projects, but they're open to offering a numerous opportunities for marketing on the moon from corporate sponsorship, educational and inspirational marketing opportunities. Here's everything you need to know. About the dawn of the lunar advertising era. <laughs> yes. That's right. Did you know advertising on the moon is cheaper than you might think? <laughs> yeah. The exact cost of Picari Sweat's moon ad has been kept secret. Astrobiotic has signed non-disclosure agreements and will reveal the price, but a, Pencil ba a Pennsylvania-based firm, Ballpark Fees, are public. They charge as little as $1.2 million for a kilo of cargo delivered to the moon. Picari Sweat's parent company, Otsuka. <laughs> Well, they likely paid much more than that for the ad. They also had to hire a Singaporean firm, Astroscale, to design a custom Picari sweat can that can withstand the rigors of space travel. But it's doubtful the cost of dropping that can on the moon will reach $8 million, the cost of a single minute of advertising during the Super Bowl. To give you a little comparison. Yes. <laughs> Well, this Picari sweat can is missing a crucial ingredient, though, of course, and that would be moon water. Yes, the moon-bound Picari sweat isn't liquid. It's a powder like Kool-Aid or Tang. To fulfill Picari sweat's goal, in which a future astronaut drinks the can's content, scientists will first need to figure out how to extract... Are, are, you, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> 2015, yes. all our technical advancements, yes. you know, we, we're, we're paying a Russian taxi fare to the International Space Station, yes. <laughs> and now we're figuring out how to put water to go up and mix with the sweat from Singapore on the moon. <laughs> you know, this, this, ladies and gentlemen, is evidence of why our species needs to be extinct. That's it. And that's it for the story, too. I ain't reading anymore. Uh. <coughs> no, it goes on for about another six paragraphs, as many of the stories that Kissy prepares for us. Yes. Uh, but we're, we're we're not going there. I think it should be short and sweet. No, no, it's it's Picari Sweat, Louis. <laughs> well, I'm going to... Uh, mm, mm. Gotta, sorry, I had to clear that sweat out of my mouth with some Tim Hortons dark. Yeah. Mm. Well, moving on, surveillance emerges and as an issue, of course, in the presidential race coming up for 2016. In Washington today, the debate over government surveillance is emerging for the first time in recent years as a significant issue in the presidential race. Blurring party lines as candidates such as Rand Paul and Bernie Sanders go after many of the same independent-minded voters worried about government spying. The 2016 presidential race is the first to be held in the wake of the 2013 revelations by a former National Security Agency contractor, Edward Snowden, that the agency engaged in a mass collection of phone metadata for millions of Americans not suspected of any terrorist activity. Analysts say the surveillance issue is a way for candidates to distinguish themselves from one another, especially in the crowded GOP primary debates. Well, I guess it's crowded down below. Uh, Donald Trump isn't crowded. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where it
it separates a privacy rights proponents such as Paul, a Kentucky senator, and Texas Senator Ted Cruz from security hawks such as New Jersey government Governor Chris Christie and Florida Senator Marco Rubio. It's also a way for Sandersto to set himself apart from more than the hawkish Hillary Clinton in the Democratic primary, analysts say. The Snowden revelations give the candidates something to talk about that they couldn't talk about before, either because they didn't know about it or because it was classified and couldn't be discussed, says Gregory Nojum, a senior counsel for the Nonpartisan Center for Democracy and Technology. In the aftermath of Snowden, we're finally getting a real debate over the Constitution, he says. The debate comes at a time when Congress is increasingly struggling with the balance between civil liberties and homeland security. Lawmakers voted earlier this year to end NSA phone data programs as libertarians, some Tea Party conservatives, and liberal Democrats united to force changes to the Patriot Act. More recently, privacy advocates have held up Senate passage of a cybersecurity bill that civil liberties groups warn could lead to more government surveillance. Libertarians like Paul and progressives like Sanders very have very similar takes on the need for privacy rights, says Daryl West, founding director of the Center for Technology Innovation in at Brookings Institution. Brookings Institution. Yes. Uh, isn't that that mental home up in central New York State? <laughs> Well, it's the politics of strange bedfellows. Mainstream Democrats and conservatives are less likely to share their fears because they see the world as being dangerous and the U.S. is needing to engage in surveillance. The recent GOP presidential debate showed just how heated that fight can get. Well, no, it didn't. It was all about uh, Trump and that woman from Fox. <laughs> Well, in a testy exchange, Christie accused Paul of endangering national security by pushing to end the NSA's mass phone data collection program. Paul said Christie would sacrifice the Bill of Rights by continuing the warrantless surveillance of most citizens. Democrats have not yet had a debate, but the issue is likely to emerge when they do, West said. Sanders, while serving in the House, voted against the Patriot Act anti-terrorism law that was rushed through Congress and passed on October 1st, 2001, a month after 9-11 terrorist attacks. Clinton, who was a senator from New York at the time, joined with 98 other senators to pass the law, which the government later used as justification for the mass collection of Americans' phone data and other controversial surveillance programs. That clearly is going to be a big point of contention when they get a chance to debate, Wes said, but as far as Scooby-Doo matters, they don't care. (laughs) (laughs) Well, beyond the competition with members of their own parties, Paul and Sanders could find themselves competing with each other to try and attract independent voters to their respective parties, all 3% of them. Now, states with open primaries allow independents to vote in either Republican or Democratic contests. About half of young millennial voters identify themselves as independent, or they're more distrustful of government surveillance than older Americans, according to surveys by the Pew Research Center. The issue is likely to heat up this year or in early 2016 when the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, an independent agency within the executive branch that was created following a recommendation by the 9-11 Commission. It is expected to come out with a report about sweeping government surveillance powers authorized by the Executive Order 12333, says Julian Sanchez, an expert on surveillance issues at Cato Institute. Critics say the order issued by President Reagan back in 1981... (laughs) And updated by President Bush in 2008 before he walked into a wall. (laughs) Well, it allows the NSA to engage in a warrantless collection of storage of actual audio content of phone calls made by foreign nationals overseas, even if those calls involve innocent Americans living in the United States. Critics say it's worse than the NSA program that Congress just uh, eliminated because the program only collected data about what phone numbers were called and how long the calls lasted and what time that they were made. It did not include the context or contents of those conversations. The order also has been used to allow the government to collect Americans' emails and texts without a warrant, as long as those emails are collected outside. U.S. Americans' emails are often routed through Internet servers outside the country. 
I would anticipate that whatever they, the privacy board, have to say is likely to feed into the presidential campaign because these candidates can respond with either, as president, I will vigorously continue the surveillance power, or I will issue a new executive order to restrict what they're doing. At this point, it's hard to say which position will appeal more to voters, analysts say. Part of the answer will depend on how worried Americans are about terrorist threats heading into the election. I think the balance of power between privacy rights and surveillance depends a lot on global events, West said. Every time there's another terrorist attack, people become more open to surveillance. Well, I guess that's why we got Bangkok. Yeah. Moving on today, uh, we got a word here from the lawyer. Witnesses saw a cop high-five a dead teen's body. (laughs) Yes, the lawyer for the family of Zachary Hammond says he has uncovered some disturbing police conduct in the aftermath of the unarmed South Carolina teenager's death. In a five-page letter sent to Attorney General Loretta Lynch, the FBI Director James Carney, Asking for federal civil rights investigation, Eric Bland writes that a member of a neighboring police force has confirmed to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division that after an officer shot a teen, members of the Seneca Police Department lifted his dead hand and high-fived him. (laughs) Now the letter also says that a witness saw an officer remove Hammond's body from his car before retrieving something from a police car. The officer then rolled him over on his side, put something underneath his body, and rolled him back, the letter states. Next, they're going to say, oh, yeah, you rolled him over and he was fucking him. (laughs) Well, Hammond, 19, was shot dead during a drug sting in a Hardee's parking lot July 26th. Police say Hammond drove his car at Lieutenant Mark Tiller in an attempt to run him over. The autopsy shows Hammond was hit in the back and side. In Bland's view, this means Tiller shot from the direction of the side window and was therefore not in the path of the vehicle. Well, well, no, he would have jumped a side tool. <laughs> hey, well, think about it. If he just stood there and yes. uh, got run over, you know, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll shoot him a couple of times in the head as, he, as he's speeding towards me at 80. Yes. <laughs> And I'll just stand there so that he'll be dead and I'll be really effed up, too. That's what we'll do. No, 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 no. You see, police, well, they're trained. (laughs) While this may come as a shock to a lot of black folk... Yes. (laughs) You know, you you don't just stand there and, and, you know, have the car bounce off you. Yeah. Okay. You actually step aside, let the thing go by, and then fill the mother fricker with lead. That's what you do. (laughs) Yes, there we go. Not in the path of the vehicle. Police dash cam video may show what happened, but police on Friday declined our request to release it under the Freedom of Information Act. The lack of video may be one reason why the case has received less attention than some other recent police shootings, but Bland has repeatedly said... But the fact that Hammond is white also plays a role. If Zachary were black, the outpouring of protest and disappointment from the public and press would be amazing, he tells the New York Times. You wouldn't be able to get a hotel room in upstate South Carolina. <laughs> well, and I mean, as we know, yes. you know, uh, all of these uh, unarmed black folks getting murdered, it, it's all to sell hotel rooms. <laughs> you know. Well, in our final story today, the oldest veteran in America dies. Well, I guess it would probably do me in one month after the President Obama visit. Yeah. That's right. In Washington, one month ago Monday, President Obama met with the nation's oldest veteran, a 110-year-old woman from Detroit who joined the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps during World War II at the age of 38. Emma Didlake died Sunday after a sudden illness, the Detroit Free Press reported. Emma Didlake served her country with distinction and honor, a true trailblazer for generations of Americans who have sacrificed so much for their country. President Obama said Monday in a statement through the White House press office, I was humbled and grateful to welcome Emma to the White House last month. 
And Michelle and I send our deepest condolences to Emma's family and friends and everyone she inspired over her long and quintessentially American life, including HTLA's Brock Favors. <laughs> Well, Did Lake visited the White House July 17th, traveling to the nation's capital with support from the Honor Flight Network, a national nonprofit that provides trips for veterans to visit Washington monuments and memorials. In addition to her Oval Office photo op, she also visited a memorial devoted to her hero, yes, the World War II President Franklin Roosevelt. Well, there we go. And that's all we got for you today. That's right. Nothing but condolences today. We're sorry you're all dead. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to thank the one, the only Louis Lawless for being here today. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. Uh, yeah, about dead people. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. That was a mistake on my part. No, it's okay. You you enjoy it. It's you know. <laughs> Hell, you know, if there's one one thing that keeps you coming back here every day, Louis, uh, if it's dead people, then all the more power to you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. I know, and you didn't, and you feel like you want to die. I know. <laughs> also, Gilbert, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you for listening and support the show for the love of God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're always so adamant about that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Everything that could go wrong goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, you you actually did that right. You know. <laughs> uh, tell them where to find you on Twitter again. On Twitter. Yeah. At Real Gilbert ACP. Yes. Don't forget to follow us on our Facebook page. Ah, yes. On Twitter yep. and on Instagram. That's right. And get on over to uh, New York's BestTalk.com. That's where all the fun, excitement, and naked, shaved women are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I want to do a special shout out and thank you to Phil DeYoung, the one and the only Devlon Crawford, uh, the intern, all the folks. Uh, Leanne, uh, thanks for joining us today. And we will catch you tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern, for your Tuesday espresso. Have a great night. Radio 1.